And then you kind of go, how now did what? you get to that point? Kia ora, Koto. Welcome. Uh, welcome to those that are present here in Atatago, but also welcome to all of you who have linked in from your own campuses or via your desktop, whatever. Um, it's great to see so many um, joining in this session, and I'm delighted that we've got three um, editors from a variety of journals to, uh, to talk about the nitty gritty of getting published. So um, I want to make most of the time from our panel members, so I'm going to um, assume that you've read their, their bios, and, um, and I'll introduce each of them now. So Alex Gunn is directly to my right and um, publishes or, and is working in the area of education. Etienne Nell, who is in, working in the area of geography, and Janine Hayward in political studies. So one of the things that I thought I'd add is um, I'm Karen Nian and I'm chairing the session. And um, one of the things that I thought would be good is if you have questions in the question time, if you could type those in and we can see if there are kind of themes across the questions that the panellists can address. So on that note, we'll get underway. And the first question is, which journal and why? And I thought I'd get Alex um, to talk about the importance of aims and scope. So Alex. Uh, kia ora, Karen. Uh, kia ora, Tefano. Nice for everyone to join in. Thank you for the opportunity to um, talk to the uh, engaged social science um, uh, scholars about publishing. So, um, Karen has asked me to talk about journal scope under the broad rubric of figuring out which journal uh, you might want to um, submit to for publishing. So. Every journal will have um, a statement of its aims and purposes or its scope um, stated. And it's often in the front or back cover of the journal or when you go online to look at the journal, um, there'll be a statement of that on the journal's website. And so the first thing that we would encourage all authors to do is to read the aims and scope. And I mean, that, and I say that with a smile, but I actually mean that seriously. Because um, when uh, submissions come into journals, they need to get past the first hurdle, which is the person who receives the submission uh, making a decision that, oh yes, this is the type of article that we would like to publish in our specific journal. And so um, being familiar with the aims and scope of the journal um, is a really critical um, step for you in deciding which journal to publish in and why. Now those um, aims and scope will typically um, have a statement about the journal's intended audience and so you need to ask yourself the question, is the audience that I'm imagining when I'm writing this article, is that the same audience as this journal is targeting? And if it is, then that's a good first step. Um, because the issue of voice will come in um, in your journal uh, submission later and, and so you need to be speaking or, uh, or addressing the readership in a way that looks and feels like it's a good fit for that particular journal. The other thing that um, a journal scope will often have is, um, is a statement around the types of articles that will be uh, accepted and any particular unique uh, um, types of work that that journal has a specific focus around. For instance, the New Zealand Journal of Education Studies has a particular commitment to uh, biculturalism and bilingual and publishing in Te Reo Māori. And so if you um, are writing in Te Reo Māori, then uh, NZJS would be a good journal um, for you to submit articles in uh, around educational issues uh, in New Zealand. So um, the scope can give you um, a good heads up into any kind of unique features that's a, that would fit well with the type of work that you're wanting to publish. So the last thing I'll say about this is uh, one way to make sure that um, you've got a good fit between your article and the aims and scope is to try and capture the aim and scope somehow in your article title and in your article's abstract. So if 
if we get a, a submission to NZJS, for instance, that has nothing to do with New Zealand education or, and nothing to do with anything that looks like it would fit with New Zealand education or schooling or anything like that, then we're probably going to um, think hard about whether that article goes to review in the first place. So if you can capture it in your title and in your abstract, then you're opening the door um, to your article going into review. Thank you, Alex. Janine, yeah. on readership. So, yeah. so uh, well, thank you, Karen. First yeah. of all, this is a great um, event to be at, so thanks for the invitation. So in terms of readership, I just will make a few comments that continue on, really, from what's already been said. Um, I think particularly when you're starting out and becoming familiar with how to publish in journals, you get you, you will often hear the message that you should aim for top-ranking journals and be ambitious where you're going to publish, and you're probably thinking to yourself, I'll just publish in any journal that'll have me, really. Um, and I think, you know, you've got to try and find a way to negotiate between those two things. So I just want to suggest a couple of ways to think about that as you're, as you're getting going. The first thing is to think about what conversation do you want to join? And I think I like to think about journals as conversations because... Um, as you become more familiar with your own field of research, you'll notice which journals the people that you publish in, uh, the people that you use as your sources publish in. And I think it's really important to pay attention to that and to find out where they're publishing their sources that you're using and what that, how that journal is developing over time, especially if they're not, it's not something that's been recently published. So think about that idea as a, as a journal, as a conversation, and think to yourself, what is the conversation that I want to join, um, and how am I going to think about how that influences my work? And I think in terms of readership, um, it's really important, again, in terms of the scope and aims of the journal, that the journal is targeting to a particular readership, and you need to think about what that means for what you publish. So what is it that they're expecting to see from you? And there are all kinds of um, questions about particularly the methodologies that you use and other things that are really important to bear in mind. Some journals that you would like to join a conversation in the conversation that they're having, uh, it may be that your approach to how you're doing it slightly challenges the conventions of that journal, and I think it's important to be realistic about um, your choices at different stages in what you're publishing. And I think it's also important to realise that the journal that you choose is going to have an influence over how you write your article. Because, for example, I study, I work in the area of New Zealand politics. So when I choose to publish New Zealand politics within New Zealand journals for a New Zealand audience, I can write things very differently than I do when I choose to publish New Zealand work for um, an audience that's international or comparative or any other form. So I think it's important to know in terms of readership, in terms of what the journal's expecting to see, how that's going to influence what it is that you can say. Because if you're writing something domestic, as I do, for an international audience, that dramatically reduces the detail I can get into because I need to provide so much context and other information for the readership. So it's sometimes a kind of organic process. You have an idea that you want to publish, you want to join a conversation, and then you try and work out where the fit is. So you may need to go back and revise your expectations of how you'll write it. But I think starting out with some understanding about that relationship between the readership and you is important. Thank you. <coughs> Etienne. Yes, thank you. Good morning, everyone. And thank you, Corin, for this opportunity. I'd like to just endorse what my colleagues have said. And in terms of how you think through an article, what readership you're aiming at, the type of aims and scope of the journal you're targeting. I think the first point I'd, I'd like to just make is we have to always be cautious that you might have found out something really valuable and fascinating, but that doesn't mean it necessarily accords with the scope and aims of the journal you've targeted. Mm -hmm. So just be cautious that you're aiming for the most logical journal for your material. But within that journal, obviously most journals will have different types of articles. And you need to think through what, what have you produced or what are you likely to produce. And a range of the typical article types would be, the most common one would be research articles or sometimes they're called original articles, which you could imagine as part of a, a PhD thesis research or a small research project. But then we get review papers, 
some people might see this as a literature review paper. We get book reviews, and many journals will have specialist subdivisions as well. For example, some journals might have a specialist subdivision looking at policy issues, in which case it might be more a reflective piece or a commentary that they're looking for rather than necessarily original research. Some journals encourage having research notes, which is more perhaps a statement of a methodology you've engaged in or a method methodological point you'd like to make. And others might have a, a unique section. For example, many um, tertiary level journals will have a, a pedagogy article related to education uh, conveying, conveying information in their particular field. So you need to think through not only the, the right journal, are you meeting the aims and scopes, scope of it, but also what type of article are you most likely to position your material in. But then to move on to the second part of the question, which I was asked to look at, which is the transition from thesis writing to writing an article. And for me, there's often quite a strong conceptual shift taking place, because often someone writing a PhD has a natural inclination to use the same arguments of their PhD in an article. And that simply in length terms is not possible. And it's unfortunate when you you'd get an article which is good, but it's simply overcrowded with information because the person is trying to summarize a PhD down to five or 6,000 words. And that's simply not, not feasible. So one has to rather look at uh, a completed or a PhD in progress as a series of logical subdividable units. Sometimes you might have done case studies which would lend themselves on an individual basis to a paper. But other times you might have to select a theme which runs through a thesis or a particular concept. And, and that really relates to the type of research you've done. But in some ways, you almost need to go back to thinking of writing an undergraduate essay rather than writing a PhD when you think of writing an article. So a core argument, probably one core theme, perhaps one or a limited number of case studies, rather than trying to, to distill a 300-page thesis down into 10 pages. Um, and when one does that, just, just bear in mind that to be accepted, you need to be saying something original, something new, and um, something which, if people have mentioned it before, you're going to give a new spin or a new orientation to it. So not only must you tailor your article to, to the, the type of articles the journal publishes, not only must you narrow down your focus to a core series of themes, but you've also got to say something new, something to convince the, the editor and the readers that this paper is worthwhile, that you've proven a point, that this is laying a groundwork um, for future research and inquiry. Thank you, Karen. Thank you. Thank you. So we're going to move to the second question that we have posed um, for our panel. And um, what advice would you give on the following? So again, beginning with you, Alex, in relation to online mm. submission. So thanks, Karen. So um, <clears throat> Online submission is uh, becoming more and more the norm, but not all uh, forms of online submission are equal. Um, and so uh, it, you have to take um, the submission platform, the software that you interface with the journal through on a case-by-case -case basis. I think um, the three or four things that I'd say about uh, getting ready for online submission of your article is... Um, and the first one is to go on and check out the online system beforehand, which will likely necessitate that you uh, establish for yourself a username and password for the system. And um, these vary for, from journal to journal, even if you're with the same publisher, like uh, Taylor and Francis, for instance. Um, oftentimes each journal will have their separate uh, online um, login system. And it's very easy <laughs> to lose track of your usernames and passwords, I have to say. So um, just a quick tip around that. Wherever you've got your um, article uh, archived on your uh, computer system, just put the emails that, a copy of the emails that came from when you logged into the online system with the article so that it's in the same place. Otherwise, it's really easy to lose track of those things. So do go in um, and set up online beforehand. And oftentimes, some of the major publishing houses, Thompson and uh, Routers, for instance, will ask you to fill in a, um, an author profile. 
um, and uh, they'll have questions for you about what are your research, what's your research interests, what's your research expertise, and they'll often have um, drop-down menus where you can choose uh, from um, already predetermined options or you can create your own. So do give yourself a good half an hour in this process to, um, to go on and set, set up your profile accurately. Um, the other thing about that is um, if you go on and check it out before you're ready to upload your um, work, you can see whether there are um, text boxes in the actual form that you have to fill in or whether, and whether you're going to need to upload documents. And so what I would suggest is um, when there are... Uh, pieces, uh, uh, questions on the forms that you um, have to fill in um, in sentences or write a statement about something, that you take a note of what that is and then do it in Word and cut and paste um, that into the actual online submission um, rather than trying to do it while you're actually logged into the system, um, you know, just uh, as you go. Um, the other thing is the online system will typically generate um, automated messages for you. So you'll get a message to say your article's been uploaded and it's, been, and it's now going to the next stage. Don't be afraid to log in periodically um, and check to see the kind of status of your article, where it is in the, in the um, peer review process. And I would suggest Give it about three months, and if things aren't changing on the online system, don't be afraid to email the managing editor. There'll be a contact um, uh, in the online system. Don't be afraid to email them and just uh, have a polite inquiry about uh, where your article is in the review process and do they have an um, estimated uh, response time. Sometimes journals... Uh, you know, take a really long time to get articles through review processes. And in some instances, you can submit a journal article one year and it might not get into print until, you know, way down the track uh, at the next, you know, the following year. So um, do bear that in mind when you're, um, uh, when you're submitting. And the other thing to bear in mind about online submission, you'll usually have to upload your article um, in two forms, a blinded copy and a non-blinded copy. And just make sure that when you, when you submit a blinded copy that it really is blinded, <laughs> including removing um, references from the reference list that's to your own work that you might have referenced. So you can put a note on the reference list in the blinded copy saying X number references removed for blind peer review. Because it's um, uh, it can be tricky um, if people forget to um, blind their work when the um, process is a, bl is a blind peer review process. So the key to the online submission is get organised before you go to hit the send button and upload button. Thank you. So Janine, I um, wanted you to talk about tone. <laughs> Thanks tone. for that. Yes. A really <laughs> early one. Um, so I would say scholarly, <laughs> and then I'm not sure what to say about how to explain what that is. But um, again, I would encourage you to learn from the people that whose uh, writing you read that inspires you. So when I'm going into um, editing something of mine to the point that I'm thinking about carefully thinking about tone. There are a couple of people that I always find just fabulous writers. I really love the stuff that they do and I wish I could write like them. So I will read something of theirs before I edit my own work and I will deliberately think about what it is, what is it about what they're doing that I find so refreshing and accessible and good. And I'll think about how to use some of those techniques in my own work. So you know, when you when you are reading the people that inspire you in the scholarship, that is what you should be aiming to replicate. So just think about think about what it is that they do. Um, but I would say, in terms of tone, um, that that language is really important, and I think that's particularly so for people who work across disciplines. And I think the sooner that you become multilingual in terms of how you can present your work, the better. So if you know that you want to speak to a number of different audiences you will need to adapt your tone for that. So in some of the stuff that I do, I write for either political scientists or I occasionally stray across and 
try and write um, for a, more of a legal audience. And I know that I need to change my emphasis when I do that. So I will often give it to a, um, a couple of people that I have who I will say, I'm trying to speak to a legal audience with this. Tell me what I'm, tell me what they're going to see that I'm not aware of, that they're going to be cross about. And it's often just the care that you take around particular concepts, the way that you use particular language in your own discipline that becomes second nature and you forget that other disciplines see things differently. So if you're working across disciplines in particular, it's really nice to have some people that you can call on to say, what would your audience say about this? So when I switch some, some of my politics into law, I just know that I've got to be really careful about what I say things are and what they mean and all those kinds of things. That It's just read differently by different audiences. So perhaps that's a particularly practical aspect of tone mm. to be aware of. Thank you, that's great. And I'm learning on the, as this is great, hearing <laughs> with all these kind of views. And Etienne, thank I've asked you. you to talk about the cover letter. Yes, thank yes. you for that. Just slightly before I get onto that, I'd like to just add something to what Alex mentioned regarding the online submission process, where you are able to look at your profile and see how your article is progressing through the system. But you might, it, and it will vary between different systems, but some on some journals, it might appear that your article hasn't gone out for review yet. That often doesn't, isn't actually the case. Because what sometimes happens is, let's say there's three reviewers assigned to your article. Two reviewers could have read it and actually submitted their reports. But if the third review, reviewer hasn't accepted the invitation to review yet, the article is going to sit in a pending box as if it hasn't gone out yet. So please don't get distressed if you see that has happened. There's, there's sometimes glitches in the way the computer system operates, which aren't, aren't ideal uh, for us to, to, to know. But getting moving on to the cover letter. Now the cover letter, the requirements do differ from journal to journal uh, for this. And obviously editor to editor will have different expectations of this. So it's important that if there is any guidance given in the journal instructions, you have a look at what, what they're asking for. But in general terms, this letter is your sole chance to really engage with, with the editor, independent of the article, which must stand on its own. It's an opportunity uh, for you to explain the basis of your work. You can say where you're coming from. Are you a PhD student? Are you working? Um, what are you trying to achieve, etc. But it's also a chance for you to explain what market, what audience are you targeting the article to? And particularly if this is your first time in the process, it might give some steer to the editor to help guide you in case perhaps you've argued, for example, it's a policy review paper, when it might actually be more of a, a, a research article, etc. So there's a scope for some degree of engagement at that point. Some journals allow you, uh, either separately or within the cover letter, to indicate possible editors or reviewers for your particular paper. Um, and this can be valuable if there's a very small field uh, which you're trying to publish into. Obviously, the editor makes has to make the right choice about objectivity and it can't be going to someone you know. But it can be helpful if there's a unique field and you are, for example, developing a particular theory which might not be known to the editor. And so having some steer as how this review process could unfold is useful, but it certainly won't, it can't be taken as guaranteed as to um, how it will progress. Um, it's also important that you uh, specify that this article you've submitted has not been submitted elsewhere. There's an ethical issue around this, that an article can only be considered by one journal simultane at, at any given time. So submit, if people submit simultaneously to different journals, this can be extremely embarrassing, particularly because the pool of reviewers in the world is sometimes quite small in a specialized field, and it can happen that a reviewer gets back to an editor and says, actually, this is going through somewhere else and that normally means a double rejection if that is the case so one has to just be very very careful about that and um, the last reason I've got why one would motivate an editor who you are and what you're doing is sometimes some editors will provide additional support some editors for example if they recognize that you're a first-time author may well be in a position um, to, to offer some counselling should the article need to be um, 
reviewed and, and resubmitted. They might offer specific counselling as to how you should consider restructuring uh, introduction and the conclusion and drawing out findings. So please don't see it as an anonymous process whereby you're simply engaging with a machine um, when you're submitting articles. There's a person receiving the material at the other end who often wants to help you in your career development and publication um, record. And so certainly if if you find the system itself as a cumbersome process, please do email editors independent of the system to ask queries, to seek clarity, things like that. I, I continually receive messages like that. And I think most of us would be more than happy to receive them and respond as is appropriate. Obviously, bear in mind that the review process must be objective and anonymous, and we can't interfere with whatever that yields. But we can certainly, independent of that, discuss um, article design, the type of things you should be thinking about in your writing process. Thank you. Thank you. Now, respecting the word limit, Alex. <laughs> yes, the surefire way to get your work dismissed out of hand is to <clears throat> either um, uh, not hit the word limit, and which really sends a message that perhaps the um, piece will be underdeveloped in terms of an argument or its uh, reach or scope, or to um, exceed the word limit by, you know, half or a quarter, uh, because um, that's suggestive that the argument's not really tight enough or that, uh, or that you haven't been able to um, uh, communicate the message, um, you know, the strong theme or idea um, that you were wanting to. So do take note of the word limits and whether they are inclusive of references or not and stick within them. Usually in the cover letter, in my experience, the editor would ask for a statement of the word uh, number of words in the piece and, um, <clears throat> and it'll be, it will be looked for. Yeah. Thank you. Janine, referencing, referencing style. style. <laughs> yeah. um, so again, I, you, I, some people have very strong opinions on referencing styles. Um, I just do what I'm told. Yeah. And I think, you, you know, there's no point in really having a strong opinion. You will eventually have to use a variety of referencing styles depending on which journals you use. Um, and I think, that, again, it's important to be aware of the fact that the referencing style does make a bit of a difference to how you write the article. So when you know that you're using some form of in-text referencing, I actually, now that I've said that, I do slightly have a preference on which style to use because I really like footnotes and I find endnotes annoying and I don't like in-text. But, you know, you, more often than not, I've had to use some kind of in-text referencing style. So um, I think just find out. Um, I don't know about other journals, but it certainly wouldn't be something, if somebody submits a piece that's using a referencing style that the journal doesn't use, that wouldn't be something that would concern us in the first phase. It would be something that you would require them to change when you gave feedback. But, but it, you don't want to annoy anybody. So if, if the journal says which style it prefers, um, make sure that you use that. And you will become multi-purpose in terms of the referencing styles that you can use. And that's a good thing. Thank you. <coughs> and Etienne, the anonymisation process. Yes. I was trying to get my... <laughs> Absolutely <laughs> not. <laughs> no, th this has come through in a, a few, a little, some of the discussion up to this point, but just to possibly reiterate, the key to the integrity of publication is that a blind review peer review process takes place. And as far as possible, it's absolutely critical that there's no compromise uh, on the position or identity of the author or the reviewers, because that way is that that's the only way we can assure objectivity uh, in the process, both in the assessment, as well as ensuring that there's no extraneous influence on the outcome. One of the things, however, even though that might be stating the obvious, when you prepare your article for submission, sometimes identifiers might creep in. These could be things like in the acknowledgements, where you might be, for example, acknowledging your supervisor, uh, which would start narrowing down the scope as to who you might actually be, or your potential funder. So sometimes it's quite useful, for example, if you have an acknowledgement, to actually blank out key names to reduce uh, the identification chance. Other times, you might be mentioning a specific study site. Now, sometimes, let's say, for example, it's a, if it's a river system or whatever, that's broad and generic. But let's say, for example, you're doing 
be publishing a, a piece on um, teaching strategy in a university department. To start mentioning names of that department will potentially compromise anonymity. And then maybe you should consider blanking out names to, to just keep the process as objective as possible. Because a reviewer who suspects who the, the author is can be compromised and might actually decide not to review the article uh, because it simply removes the chance for a, for a blind peer review process. Um, I think one of the other things which happens fairly periodically, and this will vary from journal to journal, is some journals require you when you do the upload to upload a cover page with the title and the author's names on it and separately to load an article without any names on it. And what's basically happening is the cover page goes off to a separate holding pool, whereas the paper you've loaded goes directly to the reviewers. And even though everything else is amalgamated, diagrams, figures, tables are automatically amalgamated for you with the main paper, the cover sheet doesn't. But unfortunately, at least one out of 10 papers I see have a situation in which the cover sheet details are appearing on the first page of the article. And that actually becomes really quite difficult from an editor's point of view to remove it because what you've uploaded has often come through in a PDF format and we'd have to either get you to resubmit or scroll back through the system and try and delete the page and then re-upload it. And obviously that takes time, it takes delays. If you know you're going to have to find a half hour to do it, you're not going to send out that paper immediately. So just be careful to, to make sure that cover pages, if the journal requires them, don't inadvertently get attached to the main paper. Thank you. Thank you. Now, um, thank you for the questions that are coming in, and we're definitely going to have time for the questions to be answered. So keep a, keep a note and send the questions as you as you think of them. This, the second kind of, um, or third question actually, is finding out from our panel, um, what are the key issues in the articles that the, the journals that they've been associated with have um, noted as is kind of determining rejection or leading to rejection. And I thought we'd um, start with you, Janine, this time. Um, yeah, so I think mm -hmm. uh, there's a number of ways to answer that, but I think um, in terms of, it depends at what point in the process it's been rejected. So if we think about the um, articles that don't go out for review, there's generally two main reasons for that. One is because the main editor feels that there's simply still too much work that needs to be done on the article from their perspective of having a first read, um, or that it's out of scope would be the main issues. Yeah. Mm -hmm. um, I think, um, can I quickly say something about a, a kind of a, another important issue about um, articles that do go out for review in terms of the feedback that comes in from editors um, from reviewers about that and I think from your perspective so we would all have had the experience of having just terrible reviews of things that we've written I think that's a rite of passage and it's a moment that you should embrace and think well phew, at least I've had that experience now too um, it's often actually I, I think the fault of the reviewer not necessarily the person who wrote the article there are some people who, who <coughs> seem to enjoy writing really unhelpful reviews about work but whatever it is, um, you know, my main advice in terms of that uh, revise and resubmit part of the process is to just embrace it as an opportunity to get some really, um, don't be defensive about it when you read it and think about how, I mean, this is somebody who's actually really critically engaged with what you're saying and really try and listen to what they're saying. And you can judge for yourself whether or not you think it's reasonable or fair. I think that, um, you know, a lot of the reviews that I get back um, people who think carefully about it and say, I can hear what this person has said, I know that they expect me to do these things, but that's not what I'm going to do for these reasons. And I think that in terms of your covering letter, that's a really reasonable approach to take. But I do think um, it's a good opportunity to be honest with yourself, to not be defensive about the feedback that you've got, and to just think openly about it. Try and think how it can make what you're doing better. So in terms of that process, I think you know, again, the, the problem, ultimately, some articles are rejected because the um, article writer 
I didn't really hear the criticism they were getting or refuse to accept that it was true. They just won't. It, it, what we see it the next time really isn't substantially different mm. from what we saw before, and we're not really convinced by the explanation of why it hasn't changed much. Mm. So that's a really important part of the process. It is really tough. It can be very demoralising, but, you know, I've got to the point where I think, right, bring it on. I'm just going <laughs> to want to hear what you've got to say. Mm. And um, I'm going to pretend somebody else wrote it for this part of the process and I'm going to see whether I think the criticisms are fair and how I would approach the changes that are required. Yep. Thank you. Yes, yes. thank you. Um, I, I would agree totally. Rejection is, is a hard process to undergo. Um, but nonetheless, it does happen, unfortunately. But that said as well, it's very, very rare that you'd accept a paper first off with a single, after a single Absolutely. review. One journal I work with, I can't think of a single paper that I'm aware of where that has happened. So it's quite normal that everything probably has to be changed to some degree. And I think that one needs to be aware of that. The other thing I just want to say, direct rejection doesn't necessarily mean it's a bad paper. Sometimes there's other reasons related to that. And some can be quite, quite literally as basic as you didn't fully meet the criteria of the, the particular journal. Uh, you, you, the paper differed from the aims of, aims of scope. The one journal I'm involved with only publishes papers on Australasia. Roughly 15% of our papers are not from Australasia, so it's an automatic rejection for those. But that doesn't mean they're bad papers. Uh, and we, many of us have had the experience, you have a rejection for whatever reason uh, for a paper and you submit it to another journal which does accept it eventually. So just be aware of that, that getting that rather negative later in the post is not necessarily uh, always a statement that your work is unacceptable. Other reasons why things might not be accepted? Generally, and I'm just drawing from feedback from reviewers, sometimes the literature context is seen as being not detailed enough. Sometimes a paper is seen as not being uh, grounded effectively in key debates. Sometimes papers are criticized for limited data and, and weak arguments. And sometimes they're criticized for just the, the opposite, too much data, too many ideas to come to a, a defined conclusion. And sometimes um, articles are, are criticized for trying to achieve too much when they should really focus down on, on a single issue. Uh, lastly, some, some critique often argues that a paper might not add significantly to, to new knowledge. And I think that's one has, something one has to be aware of. You have to have a point of difference. Even if you're applying an accepted methodology or critique or whatever it is, you've got to show how, how, how what you have found adds to the existing body of knowledge as opposed to simply uh, reiterates what might have come before. Thank you. Thank you. So anything to add, um, Alex? I think the only thing that I would add is the evidence claims uh, might not be substantiated sufficiently to be um, considered tr trustworthy enough for publication. So that's a real balance between the weight of the argument, the amount of evidence, and the interpretation of the evidence, um, particularly in... Uh, well, qualitative pieces, so and which is you know, typically what I would be reviewing, involved in reviewing with. Um, you know, language is the vagaries of language uh, come in, and it's not always clear. Your interpretation is not always made explicit enough to the to the reader. So, I think that's another key um, key reason why um, some papers fall short. Um, but I want to talk about the reasons why we would take them. Yes, <laughs> yes. I agree, and that's where we're going right next. In fact, <laughs> Alex, do you want to? And yeah. I thought what I might do is just go, um, like we asked you know, to think about the criteria, and I thought maybe if we just take one from each of you and just keep going backwards and forwards mm. just to hear um, the key criteria, because I know there's probably some overlap yeah. in between your, yeah. you know, each of your experiences. So if you want to begin with a key criteria and then pass it to Etienne and so, Jane. I really like what Janine said earlier about uh, what's the conversation you want to take part in. And, um, and so one of the key signs for a paper that's likely to be accepted is that it's interesting and relevant to the ongoing conversation in the disciplinary field. And so um, your writing style, how you, in, how you actively invite the, the reader 
to want to engage with your work through your opening sentence, through your title, through how you uh, write that first sentence in your abstract is absolutely key to sparking that interest. So, um, so I think uh, if your paper is interesting, then it's likely to be uh, ex you know, uh, looked upon favourably and people want to engage with it. Absolutely. Okay. Then, then just to build on that, um, uh, looking very clearly at making sure there's a clear, logical and sustained argument developing from that introduction, flowing through the paper, being argued, whether it's the literature or the results or the discussion and the findings, but once looking for that thread going through from introduction to conclusion, which A, maintains interest, B, sustains a logical argument coming up with defined conclusions and contributions. Mm -hmm. Um, and I would say, going back to kind of where we started in terms of scope and aims of the journal, I know for one of the journals I'm engaged with, which is, is in the process of developing its scope and aims, it's really it's exciting to get papers that are a good demonstration of the scope and aims of the journal. So that's definitely something that you will have to your advantage if you know you're writing something that fits really beautifully with what that journal is trying to achieve. And... Any more criteria? If we just keep going, yeah. So for um, a minute longer. I think don't underestimate the te the surface level and technical aspects of the paper's presentation. So, um, you know the kind of the the layout, the referencing style, um, the pagination, all those things they do actually matter um, in terms of the script that you're uploading. So that, that surface level, uh, you know, if if we get a single a, a nine point spaced and single spaced dense paper of 15 to 20 pages we're gonna all foot, reach for our glasses and go wow <laughs> <laughs> are we really prepared for this mm. so <laughs> yeah. mm. I, th I think another point one which i find important for articles is to make sure that right from from the start of the article it's clear what key debates the argument is going to be grounded in. Often there's a tendency for some articles to start off with a case study in the first few sentences, and that doesn't really help you to situate the argument. So starting broad, even if it's just for a few sentences, to simply help the reader or the reviewer understand where you're situ situating your piece in the broad spectrum of knowledge. What are the key debates related to the topic? And then narrowing it down to what you're actually going to look at. I find it's a very helpful way, A, to, to sustain your argument, but B, to make it more readable and logical to the person reading it. Thank you. And one, one more from you, Janine, and then we'll open up to questions. Yeah. Um, yeah. Well, really, just uh, it's always so wonderful to get articles that just do the basics really well. So, you know, that uh, they're aware of the methodology they're using and can justify and explain that, that have got a really beautiful, clear argument, well structured. So, um, to get, just focus on getting the basics right, really. And I think the other thing, you know, again, in terms of thinking about the scope and aims of the journal, it's really nice to read things where the author themselves can talk about um, what they think this contributes to the literature in terms of if there is something particularly innovative about it. It's nice to read writers who are aware of what it is they're bringing to the conversation. Get the basics done, write a really good, solid piece, and and talk up your case, you know, be proud of whatever it is that you're contributing to the to that literature. Thank you. Now we're getting great questions um, coming in and um, and I'm just going to just do a little bit of distributing of them. So one of the ones, one of the questions is just talking about the pros and cons of publishing in New Zealand based and international based journals. And um, I know that I've heard you speak about this, um, Janine, and I just wondered whether I could begin with directing the question in your, your direction? You certainly can. So <laughs> I've always been told that there is a lot of pressure to publish in international journals, and um, I do do a bit of that, but I've actually long time ago made a decision that um, New Zealand is my audience and I want to uh, support New Zealand journals and New Zealand publications, and I do a lot of edited book publishing here, which is also something that, you know, is fairly far down the rankings, and I don't really care because... Um, you know, for me, it's about reaching the audience that I want to talk to. 
and encouraging other people to do the same. So I guess really you just need to make that decision for yourself. But um, there is some really wonderful stuff that's published in New Zealand about New Zealand. You should never consider it second rate to be publishing here about this place. But I completely accept that it's also really important that the New Zealand conversation is taken to the world as well. So, um, so you know, that is something that you should add into your portfolio. But, you know, I've, I've got this far mainly focusing on New Zealand, so... <laughs> <laughs> And I know the other panel members would love to talk about this too. And what we'll do is see if we've got enough time, but we'll just um, spread the questions around. And one of the que great questions that's come in um, is, um, you know, getting you to reflect on your first publication and what you felt got it over the line. And you might, I don't know whether someone's got an immediate kind yes. of response. Yep. Etienne. No, no, I'd be very happy to talk about that one because it was a very difficult process. And that's maybe why I'd like to share it with you. Um, I, it was actually based on my master's thesis. And at the time I'd written this master's thesis and I thought, well, wow, I've really achieved something. And I'm quite sure that most of this could be turned into an article. So error number one was thinking that, a thesis could be compressed into an article. Um, but then I, I totally misjudged in terms of how, how to structure the argument that what, it's not a thesis, rather it's a short contained piece with a single strand or defined argument. And um, the net result was after submitting it to a particular journal, it was reject, rejected twice. Um, but on the positive side, the editor noted what I was trying to do, noted where I was career-wise, and actually went out of his way to sit down with me and actually work it through and point out um, the errors I was making and how to make it a more logical argument, which meant third time around it was accepted. Now, perhaps I was in a, shall we say, unique position with that, uh, to have a person of that status being prepared to help me. But I'm quite sure that whether it's your supervisors or mentors or colleagues, that uh, people are in a position to help you in the same way, to have a look at something you want to submit. Don't be, be open about it and be willing to share it, to look for guidance, uh, to make sure that it does get published. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else want to chip in on that one? Well, we. Well, I've certainly got stories like that, so <laughs> <laughs> definitely yeah. common experience. Because yeah. the other the other questions, I'll just give you a flavour of them um, and see who wants to um, chip in. Like someone else is asking about um, acceptance rate acceptance rates and how you kind of find out that information. They've, this is someone who's um, been trying to find this out, and you know how. Um, response times too. We've kind of had a little bit of talk and someone else in relation to that um, asked, you know, is there a difference in the length of time for the review period between local journals and international ones? You know, so Alex, uh, you mentioned the three month period and, um, and people wanted to just find out if there's kind of variation on that. So a couple of kind of technical questions. And I should take questions from here as well as the other um, kind of venues. So let me know if you, <laughs> again, put your hand up. <laughs> but I'll pass that to the panel for so, now. Um, so online functions, uh, websites like Google Scholar um, publish uh, journal metrics that can give you information about um, length of time, average length of time for publication, acceptance rates, and uh, whatever H index or whatever index, or whatever, whatever the indices are that the journal might be ranked by. So you can always look at that um, and to get a sense of um, acceptance rejection rate and length of time to publication. But increasingly also, Journals are publishing with the article a statement of uh, accepted for publication, no, first received, accepted for publication and published on. Mm -hmm. So you can actually look at in journals and get a sense of the time frames that are, that are involved um, for uh, getting, journal, getting articles into print. And that reminds me of, um, to remind you to look at whether you, you will can be offered online first publication, online only publication, or, um, yeah, or online first, and then maybe follow up in the print edition of the journal later. So increasingly, um, 
uh, publishing houses are uh, letting early release, um, are having early release of articles, and so that's speeded up the process considerably. And then it'll be in a print version or an online only version, but a complete journal um, issue um, later on. Anything to add? Um, I think, oh, sorry, yeah, it, it's a very difficult one to be too dogmatic about. Uh, last year I had an article which took four years to come out, um, simply because, not because it was rejected or anything, because that was the backlog with a particular journal. And it's very difficult to have that insider information always. But certainly, as Alex has said, looking at those dates on page one will give you some sense of how many months or years sometimes it takes between first receipt of the article and actual publication. Um, and to just look at it from a different point of view as well. I mean, obviously we try and encourage as much publication as possible, but from a managerial point of view, most journals have a page length limit. Mm -hmm. And this really does actually kick in because we can't actually publish above a certain number of pages per annum. And I've seen, figures vary from journals from perhaps a 30% acceptance rate to a 90% acceptance rate. And sometimes that can be determined by simply the amount of space available in any given year to that particular journal. Now that's very difficult information to, to, to find or to establish, but nonetheless using the methods Alex has, has mentioned will give you some indication of po probably what's happening behind the scenes. Thank you. And I think we've got time to just touch on two final questions. Um, one is about making um, o open access copies of the articles available and getting anyone's views on that. And then the other one is, as supervisors, at what point do you encourage your grad students to consider publishing? So again, two interesting final questions. And if you just want to see which ones spark your spark your attention at this moment. So each journal will have a um, publishing agreement that you'll, that you'll be required to sign when you get proofs through of the article if it's been accepted for publication. That will determine um, whether or not, or advise you on uh, whether or not you can um, uh, have open access to maybe the proof version, the preprint version of the article or not. Um, and so you have to take that on a case-by-case -case basis. Um, Typically, it would be the pre-print version, so the final version that you sign off on that would that would be um, the closest to the actual published article version that uh, that a publisher might let you might let you put on your own website. Mm -hmm. Any, yep. What about as supervisors? Mm. When, when do you start encouraging grad students to? Well, I don't think there's a rule about that. Mm -hmm. um, I think there are some very good reasons why you would encourage students to start publishing quite early, or you know, mm -hmm. as they're getting going with their research, and I think there are very good reasons why you, you would encourage them not to do that. So mm -hmm. I think that's a conversation. If your supervisor hasn't started that conversation with you, then start it with them. Ask them what they think, mm -hmm. what the fit looks like from their perspective between publishing. If you've got a particular idea for something you think would make a good publication, talk to them about whether that's gonna fit nicely with the trajectory you're on with your research or actually be quite a major distraction from it. I think that's the key. Anything to add? No. Any questions here? Is there a cost? I keep hearing little talk conversations mm. about there's a cost involved um, for some journals and yeah, I've never really got a, a firm answer on that. <laughs> so the question um, at this end is, is there a cost? And because sometimes there's, um, you know, a information about a cost to publish. Mm. Any comments from? It, they can sometimes be, but you'd have to read the journal descriptions carefully to find out what that is. Generally, unless, it's, unless you pack for open access, it's not a, a requirement. Okay. And um, just going to Auckland. Uh, yes, hi. Um, my question is, what would be your advice in terms of balancing certain timelines? For instance, a lot of you all have mentioned it might take a year or two for your article to be published if it's gone through to review, but your data might be time sensitive, mm -hmm. or might just become, you know, obsolete over, over that period. So how, how would you want to, what would your advice be? 
Jim. Yeah, <laughs> I, I think that that's a very difficult one because time sensitivity um, can count against the relevance of the material you're trying to release. Um, I think there's a couple of things. One, if, if there really is time sensitivity, you possibly should be liaising with the editor um, as, the, as the article progresses. But secondly, because there's an inevitable delay, all articles will have some of their information out of date by the time they actually reach publication. So I think it's careful that the way you write your article is not written, shall we say, in a present tense situation, but more in a reflective situation of what you've found out in a specific period of time, which will help to ensure more of its uh, relevance in terms of its readability. Mm. Yeah, thank you. Now I'm, I'm going to um, bring it to a close because I'm aware that this room is, is booked next and, um, and it's an opportunity to say thank you to the fantastic panel. Um, it's you know, great to hear a variety of views, so thank you very, very much.